Welcome, I'm Emily Chang, anchor and executive producer at Bloomberg Television. And we are on day two of the Bloomberg Business Week, a week long event bringing the magazine to life and offering a window into the journey as we go to press. Today's programming is focused on tech and transformation. Amidst the pandemic, technology of course has expanded access to healthcare, food, exercise, entertainment, human connection, and has reshaped the way we work. We will be hearing from some of the top names in the industry about what's next. Before we get started, we've got a few housekeeping announcements. First, I'd like to acknowledge our solution sponsor, Deloitte, our presenting sponsor, InterSystems, and our supporting sponsor, Indiana Economic Development Corporation. If you do experience any issues with your audio or your video quality, try to refresh your browser or use the chat box in the bottom right corner of your screen. We'll give you support there. Also, you'll be able to submit questions during the interview. So while we're probably not gonna get to all of you, we will try our best. And if you want to submit a question, please click open the white tab on the right-hand side of the video window, submit your question. If you know your name and your geographic location, we'll give you a shout out. All right. Let's get started. I want to welcome our first guest, Kevin Meyer, chairman of DAZN. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. All right, let's get started. Please join me in welcoming our first guest of the day, Kevin Meyer, chairman of DAZN. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you back. It's great to be back, and I'm very impressed with your pronunciation of DAZN. <laughs> That is uh, <laughs> I well done, it. Emily. Very well done indeed. <laughs> so let's talk about that. Most people probably know you as the guy who made Disney Plus a monster success, the former CEO of TikTok. But here you are working at this sports streaming giant, DAZN. Talk to us about what it is, what's on it, and how big it actually is. Yeah, well, DAZN is a global sports streaming service. Um, it is its center of gravity. Its biggest markets are in Europe and Asia. We have the, uh, the big soccer rights that matter in Italy. They're called Serie A. We, have, we are just taking over the premier rights in Italy in the next season that starts in, in August. We have we tripled our, uh, our inventory of Bundesliga rights, which are the big rights in Germany. Uh, we have great uh, uh, boxing rights uh, around the world which uh, we had a big Canelo fight that was in Dallas just last weekend that performed really well. Um, and so we have, and we have the baseball rights. Baseball is the biggest, uh, the biggest sport in Japan, actually. We have the baseball rights that matter in Japan. So we have a big global service. Um, in the U.S., it's not quite as well known as maybe ESPN uh, is, but it's, uh, we're, growing, we're growing rapidly. It's a lot of fun. You know, I also launched ESPN Plus in the U.S., and so I have a bit of history with this online uh, sports streaming business. It's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of transition happening. We're at a tipping point, and I think that you'll see going forward more sports will be, more live sports will be consumed over the top outside of pay TV services uh, than within pay TV services in the not too distant future. Now, because you've worked with so many different kinds of content, talk to us about how sports content is different from all the rest. Well, look, I think that there's just a large appetite in the in the population and the audiences around the world for high quality entertainment product. And sports is a sub is one of the genres that's a high quality um, entertaining uh, video product. So it is it's not that different than the others. Now, one a few technical differences. Sports are consumed live, and so what you have is one of the most difficult use cases on the on video delivered over the internet, where you have to encode. This, this event live. If you're looking at on-demand content, let's say on Netflix or Disney Plus or elsewhere, there's a lot of time to, uh, to compress that signal over and over and over. You can compress those files so that you can use a lower bit rate to, de to deliver a certain quality of programming. But sports and news is delivered live. So you have one, one encryption, happens in real time, it's much harder to deliver. 
Also, there's bottlenecks that evolve on the internet because everyone's watching the same thing at the same time. That exposes all the most difficult um, sort of pain points on the internet. So you have to really manage load balancing and some other stuff when you deliver live streaming on the internet. So live streaming is the most difficult use case, and it is therefore different than entertainment. But I think from a just from a sort of a commercial perspective, if you deliver in-demand programming that people love, whether it be entertain traditional entertainment, scripted or unscripted or sports, there's a big business to be had. And I think there's a long history of uh, the people that connect audiences with high quality entertainment, sports and otherwise, uh, being very profitable. Now, given the huge shakeup that's happening right now in distribution, in platforms, it's also impacting the competition for sports rights. Disney just announced a new deal with the MLB for fewer games, but the ability to simulcast on ESPN and ESPN+. Plus. How do you expect the competition for sports rights to evolve? Well, sports rights are scarce and they are unique. And so there's always a competition for sports rights, and that's fine, that's great. I mean, ESPN flourished over the years because they have a flywheel effect. They could, um, they had a great cable distribution model, and when they bought more expensive rights that were more valuable, they could ask the cable operators to pay them a little bit more in affiliate fees. And that affiliate fee increase allowed them to go buy the next set of great rights, and you can see the, the, the resonance between those two things, charging more, buying more, charging more, buying more, and they had this great flywheel that, that, uh, that was the effect of that. And I think that's true in over-the-top delivery too. We at DAZN intend to buy great rights. We then intend to market very heavily, get an, an extremely robust uh, subs subscriber base, and then be in a position to pay the most for those rights reasonably and profitably next time around. So yes, there's a competition, but there, there, there is a, a reasonableness test that you have to that you have to believe in that people. Um, it's hard to break into that positive feedback loop that I just described, and so getting into that flywheel and then maintaining it is the key. So it seems like the one, you know, the most important thing about sports that you can watch it live. That's never going to change. So what do you see as the next level of innovation and engagement when it comes to sports streaming? Well, one, there's a lot of great revenue streams that can accrue. There's the basic subscriptions or pay-per-view events that you know where people pay for the, the the live sporting events themselves. But we've seen sports betting become become a very very substantial business. It's happening in the U.S. as states you know more and more states legalize it. In Europe, it's been legal for quite some time, uh, and in Asia, it's also uh, legal generally speaking. So. I think if you can combine the sports viewing experience with betting, and betting doesn't just have to be who wins and loses the game. There's all sorts of betting moments that happen throughout the course of a game. Who's going to score the next goal? What's the you know um, all sorts of different parameters that you can that you can think of um, that people can bet on live. So having sports betting attached to the live streaming rights on platforms which are which are inherently interactive. The zone is delivered over the top on interactive platforms, so you can place bets. You can talk to your friends. You can have a, an ongoing dialogue. Hey, I'm doing I'm doing better than you are, and you know you can kind of escalate this whole uh, betting process or fantasy sports process around the live streaming. So I think that's a, 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 an area that not only DAZN but others are getting into that will enhance the economics of, of sports. Generally speaking, you can sell merchandise. Um, there's there are there really is no shortage of ancillary revenue streams that can go along with the actual just sports streaming sale that. Um, that I think will grow the marketplace pretty pretty dramatically in the coming years. Now, at the same time, you know, obviously live sports are the key, but there's so many different ways to watch content in general, and I suppose sports is a little bit unique in that respect. But do you expect there to be consolidation in in the streaming market? I mean, can we go on with this many options? It is it's it's wonderful to have choice, but it can also be confusing for consumers. Well, I think there's a lot of options that will be viable. If you're talking about who's going to dominate, you know, have a dominant position in a global deployment of their service, like a Netflix or now a Disney Plus, you know, maybe an HBO Max, certainly Amazon Prime and Apple TV Plus. I don't. I think there's only a handful of truly global, you know, greater than 100 million subscriber base type of services that can that can exist. But that doesn't have to define success. Success, you know, both financial and for consumers. Um, can happen on a much more niche basis. If you can create a service that has 30, 40, 50 million global subscribers, that can be highly profitable and a great business. And I think there, there's a multiplicity of those that will exist over time. Some will serve certain 
audience segments, some will serve certain types of genres of programming, sports or unscripted or, you know, dra dramas that are focused on, you know, female audiences. Those are focused on male audiences. I think you'll see a lot of niches uh, survive and thrive, actually. They just won't be 300 million subscribers like Netflix is. So all the services you just mentioned, do you think, you know, do all of those count in what you see as a future of big global services or will some of those services not hit that milestone? Hard to say, <laughs> frankly. I think that's going to be, I think that the economics will probably call for three to four services that could be of that greater than 100 scale. That means one or two of them might not quite make it. Um, I don't know which ones. C clearly, you know, three of them have already done so. There's Amazon Prime, there's Netflix, and there's Disney Plus. There, you know, whether or not, you know, HBO, Apple TV Plus, um, Paramount Plus, which of those can hit that, you know, um, that, that high threshold? We'll have to see. Not, I think not all of them, probably. Disney just had a big subscriber miss on Disney Plus, though the goal is to get to up to 260 million by 2024. I mean, do you see these as sort of small blips in the road or are you still long-term bullish? Well, I'm long-term bullish. I mean, it's, they had a miss, but there are 104 million subscribers after you know 18 months or so after launch. It's pretty good. Um, look, that's a big number, the 230 to 260 million. I think that um, they are very, very um, smart and responsible executives there and my old team at Disney. If they say they're on track to hit it, I believe them. So clearly you believe there are smaller services that can survive and make a lot of money, be, be big business. But do you see services out there that aren't going to survive at all? Um, I mean, clearly there are, um, you know, I, do dozens of, of, of options that are, you know, trying to certainly hit these big milestones or even medium milestones, but it just seems like too much. There are, look, there are, I don't know, hundreds of different SVOD services at this point, mm -hmm. and not all of them will end up surviving. I think there'll be tiers of them. Be the top global tiers, again, I think three to four of those will, will, will end up being in that big, big global bucket. I think there will be tens of services, you know, the tens that will that will be in the, I don't know, 10 to 50 million subscriber base over the next several years. And then you might have a little more than that that's really small and very niche, but you're not gonna have the hundreds and hundreds that we have today. There'll be, there's always a shakeout in these markets. There's always a, a gold rush mentality. Um, and it's, it's great to try to serve consumers. I think um, diversity in voices and diversity in programming choices is a good thing, but they're not all gonna survive. There's no chance that that, that, that happens. And how much of, of it is really about, in terms of who survives, is it really about the distribution and the platform model? And how much of it is, is truly about the content? I mean, I had a guest on recently who said content is the new oil. <laughs> That's good. Look, people subscribe as much as I love the interface to Disney Plus, as an example. Look, I worked long and hard on making it a, making the interface and the app really beautiful, you know, um, emphasizing the brands that Disney have, which is one of the unique selling points of the Disney Plus service, and trying to elevate the interface and the technology and the ease of use and the pricing, frankly, uh, into, uh, you know, to be very important. But at the end of the day, people subscribe to these services for the content that's within it. So the best thing you can do as an interface is to get people to the content they want and then get out of the way. And I think, so therefore, it really is all about content at the, ultimately. Look, if you serve content up through a very poor interface or you can't find the content you want, there's barriers in place, some of these services are, are, aren't great in terms of, of the interface, then it's a problem. So I think you have to be as transparent as possible. You have to get people to the content that they really love and then melt away and let them watch the content. So in streaming services and streaming music, it's really all about the content for sure. There are some investors who think because of the massive success of Disney Plus that Disney doesn't need to own ESPN or ABC anymore. What do you think? Look, ESPN Plus has gotten to, I think, I think it was 13 and a half million subscribers. Um, so it's, it's growing. I do think, as I said earlier in this program, I do believe that over the top delivery of sports is the future and it's the now almost really. So I think that, um, I think there's a good future for ESPN, uh, either delivered through the, pay, the declining pay TV universe or moving from that into over the top. So it's really, a, it's a choice that, that the management there will have to make as to whether or not that you know, it's a very expensive um, endeavor. You could see Disney deciding to focus, hey, we're entertainment brands. We have those, you know, Marvel, 
Pixar, Star Wars, Disney. We have those brands that really matter in entertainment. ESPN is, of course, the biggest brand in sports. Whether or not you need to have that or is it nice to have, it's a, it's a, it's a decision that they'll have to wrestle with, I think. I'm not sure where, well, where they'll come out on that. So paint the picture for me, let's say five years from now. I mean, obviously things are changing fast. Um, how does how we watch stuff, whether it's sports or you know other forms of entertainment, how is it different in five years? Well, I think that we're already seeing that the, the multiplicity of different types of content that people love. I mean, I was a TikTok for a while and that user generated, you know, AI driven stream of these very short videos is a really enticing. People are spending a lot of time on that. I know I am. I think the average when I left anyway was something like over, over 60 minutes a day for each user. And there were over 50 million daily users in the U.S., daily active users of TikTok. That takes up some time. Now it's on a phone and it might be uh, video time that might otherwise have gone to some other purpose. So maybe it's incremental. I think it probably mostly is, but that takes up time. Video games have become an enormously um, sort of uh, growing uh, engagement uh, modality. And I think that that takes time away from, you know, traditional entertainment and sports video viewing. And then there's of course this growing uh, amount of that content too, the traditional video content. So I think, first of all, you can have a lot of contention for people's time and attention. And attention is the most valuable thing you can have in this economy and this ecosystem going forward. So I think that that contention is going to be there and it's going to be real. I think it's going to raise the bar for what the creative execution has to be. And I, one thing I said earlier about content being king and the interface not mattering that much, when you get to the short form video like TikTok offers, the interface and the technology matters even more than the content, I think, because that content, user-generated, you know, small little videos, it's aside from it being put together in a way that is incredibly um, coincident with what I love and what you love when you watch it, if it wasn't put together in that really great way, you wouldn't find much value in those videos. So there, I think it's much, it's almost a balance between the video, the video content itself and the way it's delivered and more in balance. So I think there's a really substantial technology component there that's not quite as important in these other services. So I think there's gonna be a real mix of how people spend their time. The device diversity will be huge. Again, I think short, short form snackables will be really uh, a, a mobile uh, a phenomenon. Longer form will continue to be viewed on the best available screen, which is typically the television set. But I do think time and attention, that's going to be the coin of the realm in the future. Interesting. Um, now, you've also been busy spacking. You did a SPAC um, <laughs> with Beachbody and your work at uh, Forest Road. I'm curious, though, because I know you're looking for another one. Is the SPAC honeymoon over? The SPAC honeymoon, it depends on how you define honeymoon. I mean, there's gold, there's again, I'll use the word gold rush. The gold rush of people, you know, piling into SPACs was ridiculous. Uh, there has been people that have probably, or teams that don't have uh, as much reason to to be in the SPAC market as maybe our team at Forest Road does have been, um, you know, maybe spoiling the market a little bit. So it's overwrought. Uh, a shakeout is a very healthy thing. I think there's too many SPACs chasing too few companies that deserve to be public, high quality companies. So a shakeout will be quite healthy. Um, and there is a shakeout happening now. It happened maybe a little sooner than most people thought, but, so, but the the onslaught happened a lot faster and sooner than most people thought too. So uh, I think that you'll have, you'll see fewer higher quality SPACs um, actually in the marketplace going forward. I consider um, Forest Road Company or FRX SPACs to be very high quality with a great management team, operators in charge, um, which I think is the really the way to go versus just finance uh, background people. Um, so I think we have a good team. I think the first deal that we did with Beachbody is great. I think we're being swept up a little bit in the overall asset class being being punished somewhat for this for this uh, for, for, for this oversupply. And I think when this shakes out, real companies like Beachbody, you know, with the one over a billion dollars of revenue, profitable, growing and strong double digit growth for the foreseeable future, I think those companies will end up, you know, being treated like a normal public company will and, and will have a stock price that reflects the actual prospects of the company versus being tied into the SPAC marketplace, which is of course now being punished somewhat. It'll shake out. I think the future of SPACs is, 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 is another financial instrument is going to be a long and healthy one, healthier than it has been in the last year, I think. So talk to us about your process. How many companies have you been looking at? How do you vet them? And clearly, you haven't found the next one yet. Um, and do you think you can? Oh, yeah, we, we can. We have a, a lot of uh, inbound uh, interest for, our, for us to take companies public. We vetted 
you know, tens of companies, you know, 30 or 40 companies already by now for the second SPAC. The first SPAC was we de spacked we found a merger candidate faster than normal. I think one of the fastest de spacs on record. We went public last year, November 30th, with the first SPAC, and we announced February 10th of this year very, very fast. Um, this one you know, isn't as fast, which is fine. I have no problem with that at all. You have two years to find a, to find a merger uh, you know, uh, partner. So we're nowhere close to that. It's just a couple months in. And we have some great candidates. We've been, uh, we're being ultra um, choosy right now, which we can afford to be, I guess. I don't want to sound arrogant, that's, you know, but, but we, we, do have, we, have, we have a pick of a lot of great companies. And so we're, being, we're taking our time and we're choosing right. So I would say that it's not a lack of candidates. It's um, we want to get the right fit. And, you know, the team at Forest Road brings a certain um, set of expertise and a certain set of capabilities, which benefits certain companies more than others. Beachbody was a great example of one that we really connected with in, a, in, a, in the right way. We want to find the right candidate now. Um, so we're in good shape. We're not worried. It's going to be great. Well, that leads me to my next question, because I was curious if is the biggest challenge finding the right company or beating the competition? Because there's private equities, there's all, all different kinds of strategic investors also out there looking for their, their one, right? Yes, it's a good point. And it depends on what you bring to the party. I, th I would say that with Beachbody, we were brought in by the team who was already in a process of, of trying to get a SPAC, the right SPAC sponsor. And they reached out to us when, you know, when, they, when we went public and said, you'd be the greatest team for us. And there are great teams for other, you know, we're probably not the best team to 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 do certain, you know, biotech type of DSPACs. It wouldn't be our, our background. But if you have if you're trying to get a consumer connection, if you're branded, if you want to, if you have a media component, if you're in the in the middle of a disruption that happens at the intersection of content, commerce, and tech, that type of thing, we're a great team for you. So it really depends on what they're looking for. And by the way, if a team is looking for if a company is looking for private equity, that's probably a different company than than is looking for a SPAC, because a SPAC is a way to IPO. So we talk to companies that deserve to be and want to be public companies, whereas the private equity guys are continuing to invest in the venture capitalists are continuing to invest in companies that want to stay private for now. So there's a, there's a definitely a bifurcation there that we're a, we're talking to different uh, different assets than the private equity guys. But among the different ways to go public, one of the one of the competitions we have is that a company can go public a regular way IPO. They can do a SPAC and they can do a direct listing. So that's also competition for us. So you got to find the the right candidate that really values what we bring and we think that we would also bring value. It's the right price. It's the right dynamic, and and it all works. Now, when it comes to at-home fitness, and clearly Beachbody is a, an incredibly successful company, but we're going through a massive, another massive transfer, transformation right now where the economy is starting to go back to normal. People are starting to go back to work. How do you see that impacting the home fitness trend that has benefited you know, many companies, you know, not just Beachbody, but also Peloton and more? I think, and time will tell, we don't know for certain, but I feel relatively comfortable that if you look at the COVID effect, and I think it's all, you know, people have said this, so this isn't the most insightful thing in the world, but it had accelerated trends that were already in place. And one of the trends that was in place is people were start, like working out from home. And I think people like to do things more conveniently. Convenience is at a very substantial premium. Again, time and attention. Convenience is really important. And I think people learned in this in this pandemic, that there are certain things you can do at home that you thought you had to go out of the home to do, but maybe you don't have to go to the, out of the home to do it. So people roll out of their beds, and it's a 30-second walk to their, to you know, whatever room they're doing, um, Beachbody or Peloton in, and they're doing it at home super conveniently versus the 30-minute drive to a gym. I think that that sort of convenience factor stays with people, and if you can replicate what was an out-of-home experience in home, I think those are the types of permanent resets you'll see coming out of the pandemic. Mm. Movies, good example. You know, you can go to a movie theater and watch a movie and that's gonna come back to to some degree for, for sure, but I see a permanent reset happening there because you see the same movie at home on a large screen television. Yeah, it's not quite as large of a screen. The sound system usually isn't quite as good, but it's the same movie. So I do think you're gonna see a reset there. Theme parks, you can wear VR headsets and you can do all that stuff. You can't recreate a theme park experience in your home. You never will be able to do that. So theme parks are gonna rebound completely and fully. So I think there's a spectrum here. Those things that you can replicate are going to stay 
um, at least in a bimodal sense, where you'll have people that go to the gym and people that also work out at home or people that just work out at home solely because of the convenience factor. So I don't think that it's the beach body is much at risk there at all. So with experiences of all kinds rebounding, whether it's theme parks or going to a movie theater or, or travel, going to a restaurant, does that impact um, how much we're going to be watching all of these platforms that we talked about at the start? Does that impact the TikToks and the Instagrams of the world if we're going to have less time to do that stuff at home? Short answer, I think it, it has to. There is going to be some impact. I mean, at home, there was much more time that you could devote to entertainment purposes and to screens and to all that stuff. I think that will decrease somewhat. I'm not sure if it'll impact the business model substantially, frankly, because there's such growth inherent in some of the platforms you just mentioned. But, you know, there'll be some impact on that. Again, time and attention. Some of the attention will be now be used commuting again. It'll be, be you'll be in the office where, you know, maybe you can't watch your favorite shows at any time like you could at home. And, um, but then again, if you're commuting and you're on a train and you can watch TikTok on a phone, you know, maybe that's uh, an enhancer to to that. I mean, let's look at Quibi. Quibi would have benefited dramatically from a continued um, commute and a continued out of home uh, lifestyle. So maybe some of the more mobile uh, centric uh, services will actually benefit from from the end of the pandemic. I think some of the ones that really are in home experiences will will, will suffer somewhat. Do you um, think Quibi and, just came out at the at, at a bad time? I mean, there was a thought that maybe it came out at the right time because we were all trapped inside. But do you think a model like that could work in some way or was that just not the right way? Well, look, I think um, Quibi, you know, there's no one more uh, energetic and more committed and more just unstoppable than Jeffrey Katzenberg. He's an incredible force of nature. And if he couldn't make it work, he can't work. I will say that 100 percent. But look, it did. Its its premise was that you could take these long form, very highly uh, produced stories and put them into bite sized, you know, reasonable, you know, create, you know, like a like Dickens did, you know, a little chapter at a time, and then it creates a whole novel. And that could have maybe worked if people were out and about in five minute snippets of a longer form story, something that was appealing to them. So I think they were harmed by that. Um, I think that they didn't benefit from the at home moment at all. Because um, they weren't intended to be viewed on a television screen, and that's where people view Netflix and Disney Plus. That's that's where that's really viewed. So they didn't benefit from that. And I also think there's probably a bit of a mismatch. I don't know that people really want to consume this high production value content that is at its very core pretty long form because it's a story arc that goes on and on and on. I don't know if a, if a phone is the right way to do that. In India, it is. There are certain markets where that actually makes a lot of sense. In the developed Western markets in the U.S., probably a mismatch of content type to 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 device also. But either way, you think there is a shakeup coming. There's no question that the world going back to normal means things are going to change, whether it's a, a lull for some of these platforms or not. Yeah, I think there's, it's, it's inevitable that there will be an impact in terms of time spent in front of screens. And this mix of screens, as I described, will likely shift. There's this massive spent time spent in front of television screens during the pandemic. Some of that will now bleed towards mobile, and that will favor platforms like Instagram, TikTok, and others, I think. All right, Kevin, um, that was very comprehensive. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Kevin Meyer, chairman of DAZN, and so many other things. Um, wonderful to have you. Appreciate you taking the time. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joshua Brustein. I'm the editor of the technology section at Business Week magazine. And I have with me here today Anjali Sood, who is the CEO of Vimeo, which many of you probably know as sort of the artsy alternative to YouTube. Um, but Anjali actually over the last couple of years has overseen a major pivot of the business to focus much more on video tools for creators from small businesses to very large enterprises. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that transformation. We're going to talk a little bit about Vimeo's um, upcoming public going, uh, it's going to start trading publicly next week. And just hear a little bit about, you know, how we got here and, and what we might see going ahead. So Anjali, first of all, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Josh. It's and great to be here. Absolutely. And I, I was I was hoping maybe you could start with just set the scene for us a little bit. We're going to talk a, a, about the changes that you brought to the company. But just tell us a little bit about where Vimeo was at the beginning of this transformation. As I mentioned, I think a lot of people do see the brand um, in 
in comparison to YouTube, and that's how they've experienced it in the past. Yeah, so I like to say Vimeo is um, both a 16-year-old video platform and a three-year-old enterprise software startup. Um, and that's because for most of Vimeo's journey in life for over a decade, we really were the sort of ad-free, um, high quality ver uh, alternative to YouTube. Um, and it was really only up uh, until about 2017 that we decided actually, rather than compete with YouTube, there's a bigger market opportunity for Vimeo, and that's to serve every business in the world, regardless of their size, budget, or expertise, with tools and software to be able to use professional quality video. And, um, and so we sort of embarked on that pivot in 2017. We spent the last few years really building, innovating, reorienting our platform to be able to serve businesses who now, especially since the pandemic, are looking to use video more and how they communicate. And we've seen incredible traction, momentum, and success. And so we're doubling down. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned, we're, we're looking to become uh, our own public company next week. Uh, and really the, the goal there is to have more focus and um, attention and being able to just invest more in this, in this strategy. Mm -hmm. I, there's been a lot of discussion and frankly concern over the last couple of years about companies like YouTube basically being too large to compete with. Um, you know, you redirected your company away from direct competition with YouTube. Is it, is it right to see this as another illustration of just how difficult these enormous social media platforms are to go up against directly? Uh, I think they're separate um, considerations. Uh, you know, it's certainly that's a whole topic around social media platforms. But fundamentally for Vimeo, the way we thought about our strategy is we want to help businesses succeed. And for them to succeed, they want to reach their audiences across platforms. So of course they want to put video content on YouTube, but they also want to put that content on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, their website, blogs, marketplaces. And so we sort of saw it more as if we really want to align with the best interests of our customers, we need to be distribution agnostic. We need to help um, these businesses get their content everywhere. And those are the types of tools we've built. Um, and so, you know, I like our position. I like where we sit, but mostly I think it's because we're really aligning our incentives and our goals with the success of our customers. Mm -hmm. So tell me how you got started. Uh, me, me personally, or uh, yeah, how, how, or, when you started it on the pivot, what was what was kind of the uh, first move, and, and how did you pitch it to your to your bosses? Sure. So I joined Vimeo uh, as a director of marketing um, at a time when we were actually pursuing uh, a slightly different strategy. We were actually looking at investing in original content, um, thinking about trying to compete with Netflix. And so um, I joined the company. I was running marketing and uh, we didn't yet have anything to market because we hadn't acquired all the content. So I just was spending time um, with a group of people at the company looking at our users and looking at the trends that were happening in our own user base and started to notice organically a lot more businesses were coming to the platform and uploading video content that, you know, previously we, we, we it was mostly filmmakers uploading feature length, you know, documentaries. And now more and more we're seeing small businesses and large businesses uploading video for social media or for their website. And so um, it really just sort of internally, uh, you know, a, a, a group of people internally, we saw, all sort of saw this opportunity that, wait a minute, maybe uh, there's a bigger market here and Vimeo can uniquely serve that market. Um, and so, you know, what sort of interestingly happened, it doesn't happen that often in, in, in companies, but we sort of convinced our investors to parallel path the two strategies. So I was given a, a small team. Um, it was about 50 people, product, engineering, support, marketing, to go and try and pursue this strategy and see if it would work. Um, and we spent a year building. We launched uh, a new software plan called Vimeo Business. It was very sort of MVP early, but we saw incredible traction. 
And after a year of seeing that traction, uh, the company decided, you know what, let's go all in on this strategy. It's, you know, the original content play, the, the, that the sort of battle streaming wars were heating up. And so kind of both things happened at the same time. Um, and so we decided to double down on, on the SaaS strategy and IAC, our parent company, uh, promoted me internally to CEO to run the company from there. So were you basically competing with the content side of of your own company and, and was there pushback or what, like did, it seems like you kind of set off a bake off uh, to a certain degree? It's, it's interesting. Um, I, I wouldn't say it was competitive, but for sure, you know, there were a lot of people at the company who were energized and excited and were getting passionate about this idea of you know, instead of focusing on the viewers and the original content, going back to Vimeo's roots and being creator first. We had this mantra internally around that. And really we were just expanding the definition of content creators. So it wasn't just video professionals and filmmakers, but also businesses. Um, and so I think there was a lot of momentum internally around that. Um, and so I, I you know, and, and I remember in when, when we actually announced that the pivot and we announced that all these things were gonna change, uh, Generally, the sentiment across the company was really positive because I think people felt like actually the strategy was more aligned with our roots and also one we were just uniquely positioned to win at. Mm -hmm. Was there a moment of no return, a moment where you realized this is actually going to be the entirety of the company instead of my own side project? Uh, yes, but I, I would say that moment was when uh, I found out that, that we were pivoting and that I was going to be put in the CEO seat, you know, I never, uh, I never really considered that um, IAC, our parent company would, would be so decisive, frankly, in kind of saying, okay, if, if this isn't working and this is, boom, let's just rip off the bandaid. And, and kudos to them. I think there's so many companies, you know, we're in a fast paced industry in video and in tech in general. And it's really hard sometimes to actually acknowledge something's not working and to really quickly and wholly pivot. Um, and I actually think uh, we did a really good job of that. You know, the, the day that we announced the pivot, we had a new vision, mission, strategy for the company. Everybody knew, you know, what that meant for them and how their work was gonna change. And, you know, I look back at those first few months and of course I wish we had moved even faster. Um, but I, I do think it was, it was a fairly sort of all in, um, move. There wasn't a lot of hedging or optionality. And I think that was important for us because this market is so large and we had to go into it saying we are a hundred percent committed to succeeding. Mm -hmm. And so tell me a little bit about how you're now at the at the moment where things will change again uh, when you go public next week. And wh what do you expect to be different about the company when, once it hits the public markets and, and spins out from IAC? In terms fundamentally, in terms of what we're building, our mission and how we're operating, really nothing should change. As I said, we're just doubling down. That being said, there are a couple of things I think about. Uh, in particular, you know, just making sure that as a public company, we stay long-term focused. Uh, I think about this market in terms of decades, not years. Um, and you know, once you go public, you suddenly have a stock price that's and and you know, you have quarterly earnings and you have movement and and sort of noise every day. Um, and so, you know, I think it's it is an important thing for us as a company. It's my job to make sure that we do stay focused on the long term and that that's something that our employees um, are encouraged and and um, set up to think about and also with investors externally and, and with our board you know this is as I said it's, it's a large market we think 70 billion dollars um, market for every business in the world to use video and uh, and we have just a teeny tiny sliver of that today um, so it, it really is important that when we think about the investments when we make decisions we have that long-term lens so that's one the other one I'd say is, Vimeo's always been scrappy. Even as we've scaled, we've acted like a startup in our culture and our ethos. And I think that's something really important that, you know, as you grow, you get more layers, you get potential bureaucracy. And we're raising, you know, we've raised capital. We're going public to speed up, not to slow down. Um, and so there is a lot there that I think about, my team thinks about, in how we operationalize and work internally, sort of this, this real desire to stay scrappy. Mm -hmm. So you you came up within IAC and, and now you're spinning out. Um, 
what changes with that relationship? I mean, I know they have the building. I don't know if you are, are you moving out of home? Are you moving out of your house or? Um, I think at some point, uh, but that's all stuff we're, we're, we're figuring out. You know, I certainly the relationship changes. Um, but in many ways, I think we've we've gotten a lot of incredible benefits from IAC that I hope continues. Um, you know, I, I share this phrase that I think is really um, accurate for what uh, how IAC thinks, and it's something that I think we're, we think about, which is impatience on execution, patience on vision. It's something that IAC has always kind of um, really. Um, inculcated in us. And um, I think you'll see us sort of take that culture from IAC and use it at Vimeo. And really what that means is, yeah, we're going to, we are focused on our vision and we're unwavering and committed to that and thinking in the long term. but we're also going to act with urgency because this market is now and the businesses need video now. Um, and so it's sort of, how do you balance those two things? Um, and I think we've done it well over the few, last few years uh, with IAC support. And so that's something that I think will continue for sure. Mm-hmm. T- tell me a little bit about who your customers are. I know you have a, a large amount of, of customers, some of whom um, are, are premium and some of whom are, are not paying and just using uh, using the service for free. Can you just talk a little bit about what that looks like now and, and how that might change over time? Yeah, you know, Vimeo, we're a pretty classic freemium SaaS model. So we have 200 million users on the platform who are just engaging for free and they are all types. Um, video professionals, um, businesses of all sizes. And then within that, we have about 1.5 million paying customers. Uh, and they, they range from the mom and pop shop to the uh, growth stage startup to the Fortune 100 company. Um, you know, we've shared uh, that, you know, in, in the last few quarters, our enterprise business, a large organizations using video, that business is really exploding. Our enterprise revenues up 100% year on year for the last few quarters. And we're seeing companies like Starbucks, Amazon, Rite Aid, Deloitte, um, New York Times, all sort of using video now in ways that they weren't before. So I think um, increasingly that, that sort of, if you look at our user base, we continue to sort of increasingly grow the percentage of businesses on the platform. And if you look at the sizes and the sort of sophistication level, it's very broad. And we believe that every business, regardless of their budget and size and expertise, should be able to use professional quality video. So you'll see us when we launch new features and products, we're not just building for the most sophisticated um, customers. We're really thinking about how to radically simplify the uh, access to these tools tools so that really any business can use it. Mm-hmm. What are the ways that videos are uh, that businesses are using videos uh, in changing in changing ways? Are they are they making just more like video kind of commercial and, and consumer um, uh, communication? Or is this for, for internal communications or kind of where's where video where's that growing the most? Uh, so we're seeing video and Vimeo being used um, in really two two different ways. One is a using video to communicate externally with your customers. And there it's really, you know, every business that has a website or social media account or marketplace listing wants to use video the same way that they've been using image and text because video is more engaging. You can get higher clicks. It's prioritized more in social feeds. And if you actually look for most businesses, it's hard to create like professionally produced branded, um, you know, 15 second videos for Instagram. You want to do that several times a week and doesn't, you know, historically the only way to do that would be you'd have to hire a crew and spend tens of thousands of dollars on a budget. And so we've boiled all of that down into a simple mobile app called Vimeo Create. It helps any business create content in a matter of minutes that's professionally produced um, and that, that they can edit and, and, and then distribute. And so that's one, I would say, very key example of what we see businesses do. We also see businesses doing things like live streaming events obviously since the pandemic, you know, that's been really important. Um, and then there's the internal, you know, using video to communicate internally with your stakeholders, with your employees. We see a lot of demand for that. People are using Vimeo to uh, securely live stream their town halls, their company town halls. They're using um, Vimeo to uh, train and onboard employees. 
Um, you know, Amazon is using us to for their customer support team for customer education videos. Um, and so, and these are all just some of the areas. I think the bigger theme is that we're seeing video proliferate in all the ways that businesses communicate. The same way email and chat have become such cornerstones of how businesses communicate, we really think video is going to touch every. Um, point of the organization. So if you think about, um, you know, every department in a company, you think about every team in a company, they should be using video more. Um, and you'll see us expand our tool set and our use cases pretty substantially this year to better serve more of these teams and departments. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about how you have experienced the change in media consumption habits during the pandemic. Um, how that's affected your business and, and which things you think are here to stay and which things might kind of revert back to normal as people re-enter their offices and go back to whatever normal life will look like. Uh, I think, uh, I would say overall, I think the pandemic has changed behavior fundamentally. We are all now used to, um, you know, being in front of the camera, both the, the, the sort of the talent and the creator. And I think all of our expectations for engaging professional, real-time visual content, that's not gonna go away. Um, and I think we see it in our business. You know, we see that the demand from the pandemic, it has really sort of, it's, it's sort of settling at a, at a clear elevated new normal. Um, and that's across every type of customer that we see. Um, but I think in terms of, I'll, I'll give you some of the examples, you know, we provide the capability for um, anyone to actually build their own uh, their own Netflix, basically their own digital video channel, um, and charge what they want. And you know, obviously, since the pandemic, we've seen you know fitness studios and gyms use us. We've seen performing arts organizations use us because they were in lockdown to be able to still um, get their their content out to to their um, user base. And so many of them have actually dramatically expanded their customer base because now they're not confined to a physical location. And when we talk to them, of course, they're excited to open their studios back up and, and to, to perform live again, but they're not going to sort of stop live streaming. They're not going to stop streaming that content to all the other people out there um, who, who didn't previously have access to it. So I think video will be an and. It's not an or. You'll see a lot more hybrid um, use of, of in-person as well as video. And ultimately, I think this is a very, very good thing for businesses. It basically opens up a whole nother revenue stream and model for them, which is good, uh, I think, for the economy as well. Mm -hmm. So you're helping businesses not only produce videos, but set up um, like revenue models like subscriptions um, and, and things like that. Like that would, so I, I know that there's actually been a, in other areas of media, we've seen this growth too. You have Substack, doing newsletters, you, you have other um, companies really building tools that uh, creators are using for their own distribution, as opposed to relying on like a YouTube for distribution or, or uh, being kind of an influencer on an existing social media um, network. Can you just talk a little bit about how that market is emerging and, and like how, how you see yourself fitting into those, uh, that range of companies that seems to be doing quite well in, uh, in this era? Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, this is a, a really fast-growing part of our business, and um, it's it's we we have a it's called Vimeo OTT over the top, which basically is it's a product that allows you to go direct to your customers with your own um, video channel, and then you own the relationship with that customer, right? And you can monetize that content in, in more flexible ways, which to your point makes a lot of sense, you know. And and it's not instead of YouTube or again instead of these social media platforms, it's more that there's certain kinds of content that you're going to put on, on that on those platforms for free um, and you have an ad based model but now you can also drive people to your owned and operated destination and in many cases what we see is that there's sort of passionate niche fan bases around certain kinds of content where you might not get 10 million 
you know, viewers, but you will get a subset who are willing to pay for that content. Um, and so it's, I think it's a very viable, sustainable model. We've seen an explosion in, in sort of the demand there. I think today we're powering over 2000 of these channels. Um, and, and, you know, I remember sitting a couple of years ago thinking, questioning how, like maybe there could be 10, you know, direct to consumer channels out there and, sure. and 2000 our platform alone. So, um, so I definitely think this sort of democratizing the ability for um, these content creators, these brands, they're fe- we're ba- basically allowing many more people to become media companies. Um, and I think there's an audience for that and it will continue. Um, and, and, you know, the, the in- most interesting thing is just the diversity of the types of content that we're seeing. It really is everything from, um, you know, uh, fitness to faith to entertainment to sports to educational content um it, it's quite broad in terms of the range and and so i think that makes sense you know it makes sense that there's certain content that people will pay for where it, you're better served you know having a subscription model versus just relying on advertising mm-hmm. i know you said that there's a, a wide range are there particular types of content that you think work particularly well for this sort of video subscription model um, or or when you look at those 2000 channels are um, is there an obvious leader in terms of the types of content that tend to gravitate towards that model yeah, there really isn't one clear trend. I think the key is if you're monetizing through subscription, it obviously, you know, you, you have to have, I'd say two things. One, you have to have content that is exclusive, right? And that is, you know, for whatever reason, it's something someone's going to pay for as against being able to consume something um, for free on, on any other platform. That's one piece. And then the other piece is it's a subscription model, which means you can't, it's not just about getting someone to first watch. They have to keep watching. So one thing that we've seen as a common theme is the, for these channels to be successful, they have to be constantly creating fresh content, right? Um, and actually, the way we think of it is to have a successful OTT channel, you really need three things. You need content, you need marketing, and you need technology. And what we're basically doing is take the technology piece and making it much simpler and more affordable so that these channels can put more of their budgets and time and attention on the content and the marketing, which is really what they're gonna need to invest in to have a sustainable business. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Um, we have a couple of minutes left. We And I wanna ask a question from the audience, which is, how is Vimeo attracting new customers in developing countries and rural areas? And specifically, what's your strategy in relation to developing countries? Now, so we think that international expansion is a huge opportunity for Vimeo. We are actually more global today than not. The majority of our users are outside the US and they are distributed all over the world. Um, and so we are doing quite a bit to invest here, um, looking at our product, how to better localize that product, looking at our marketing, how to better reach um, customers and make them aware of our offering outside the US. And then our sales force, you know, we've historically had our sales force for a U.S. base. We've opened up uh, offices now and and footprints in places like the U.K., um, in Asia. You'll see us look at Latin America. Um, So you will see us really kind of expand there. But ultimately, we believe that the power of video is global and universal. The needs of businesses, you know, are fundamentally the same. We want to connect. We want to communicate. We want to grow our business. Businesses. And so uh, it's absolutely a, a big opportunity for us. And one you'll see Vimeo investing in significantly this year. Great. That makes a lot of sense. Um, well, I think we're all, about all out of time. But Anjali, thanks again for, for coming. I've been talking with Anjali Sood, um, the CEO of Vimeo. And thank you all for listening. And um, they will, again, begin uh, trading publicly on, was next Tuesday or? Yep, next Tuesday, the 25th. Okay, great. Well, thanks again for your time, and hopefully we'll get to talk again soon. Thanks, Josh. Landing on Mars is tricky. There's a complex chain of events that have to go perfectly right. To make it even more difficult, because any signal from Earth takes 12 minutes to get to Mars, the spacecraft must land on its own. 
First, it must slow down. It's moving at 12,000 miles per hour and needs to touch down at just one and a half miles per hour. The atmosphere begins this process, pummeling the craft with friction and intense heat. While it's streaking across the sky like a meteor, it's also being steered by thrusters. It's now slowed down from hypersonic to supersonic, almost twice the speed of sound. Then, a 70-foot supersonic parachute is fired out like a cannon, inflating in 0.7 seconds, slowing it down even more, just six-tenths the speed of sound. The heat shield that has protected it until now is jettisoned, giving the ship a view of the Martian surface. The spacecraft begins assessing the landscape for a safe place to land, using a new navigation system called Terrain Relative Navigation. It compares what it's seen to a database of imagery taken by Mars orbiters to determine where it is and where it should go. Still going 160 miles per hour, the parachute has done all it can, so it ejects it. The spacecraft then lights up its engines and begins steering to a spot that it has deemed safe. Hovering above the landing zone, the sky crane lowers the rover down at just one and a half miles per hour. Touchdown. Confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. Having successfully deposited the rover, the remaining portion of the ship flies off to a safe distance. Finally, we've landed on Mars. Hi, uh, welcome back everybody. Uh, I'm Max Chafkin, I'm a features editor uh, with Bloomberg Businessweek, and I am so uh, fortunate right now to be joined by Sarah Fryer, who is a senior writer for Bloomberg uh, and Businessweek. You've seen her stuff. Um, you know, all over in the magazine, you know, on the web. Uh, she covered Facebook for, I think, Sarah, what is it, more than a decade? Uh, how, how long did you cover <laughs> Almost Facebook? Almost a decade. Almost a um, decade, like eight years. You're right. So, you know, she basically knows more about Facebook than, than anybody I know. Um, she's, you know, kind of broadened her coverage, looking at big tech as a whole. Um, and I, I want to start this conversation, Sarah, with a story you published not too long ago in Business Week about um, vaccine hesitancy and and social media. Um, you know, obviously here in the U.S., we've we've seen this amazing vaccine rollout. On the other hand, the hesitancy rates are are kind of uh, remarkably high. And and the story argues that Facebook and and in, and in particular Instagram, which of course you have a an expertise in, having written um, you know a wonderful book on on, on Instagram, no filter, uh, that that this is the perfect platform for the anti-vax movement. Um, why, why is that? Like, why has Instagram in particular been such a uh, sort of hit in the anti-vax world? Well, I think that the, the way that our media ecosystem is evolving, people are following uh, their own personalized form of media. And Facebook and Instagram fuel that. They say, oh, if you're into alternative medicine, if you're into wellness, if you're into um, you know, green diets, maybe you'd also be into um, this kind of health information. And then they feed people down this rabbit hole where they end up getting um, the getting expertise, but it's bad expertise. It's from people who are not doctors, from people who are purporting to be doctors. And, and you see that not just on Instagram where people follow personalities, but also on Facebook where people get involved in groups that uh, fit their perceptions about how the world works. And then they don't end up getting information or don't end up trusting information from real medical professionals or from the government because the information that goes viral on social media or gets shared on social media is so personal. Um, the people who are sharing it are people you've developed relationships with over, over many months or years, and you trust them in a way that you may not trust other authorities. Are, are we seeing this same phenomenon? I mean, your story was mostly focused, uh, you know, kind of on the U.S., obviously, where that's where most of the vaccines are. Um, we're now seeing, you know, pretty robust 
vaccine rollout or, or, or just starting to ramp up, at least in Europe, uh, you know, and elsewhere. I mean, is the same misinformation playing out elsewhere? It is it is spreading like wildfire. And one of the big problems that we see in social media is that the companies, um, the social media companies, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, they have systems that they built first in English. They have fact-checking networks. Facebook has fact-checking networks that it established first in English. And the ones in other languages are taking longer to to be effective, to be well-trained. And meanwhile, uh, these these pieces of news uh, that are not news that are, you know, misleading, false, um, causing vaccine hesitancy around the world are being exported to other countries and going viral. And it takes even longer for them to be labeled or taken down by fact checkers. Right. So you, you've, as I said, covered this company for a long time. And I think there's a dynamic uh, that anyone who, who covers Facebook as a reporter, but probably most you know, regular people also uh, experience a little bit where you sort of Facebook will say one thing and then there's a, a reality that's that's somewhat different. Now, now, for instance, in this story that you wrote, you know, you talk about how Facebook made a policy in February basically saying they're going to remove vaccine misinformation. And then you and your co-writer on this story go looking and you see top 20 accounts, um, you know, uh, uh, on Instagram that, uh, you know, have to do with vaccines are vaccine skeptical. So it would seem like they're not actually doing the thing they say. And I'm wondering, like, what's what's up with that? I mean, is that just that Facebook, Instagram, like these are huge platforms, they're impossible to police? Is it that, is this like a strategic decision um, made on the part of, you know, the company because it's a way to generate advertising? Like why, why has kind of misinformation, especially vaccine misinformation, where, you know, there isn't this kind of like political debate where one person can say, oh, maybe, you know, it's 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 a little bit more clear cut. Why has it been so hard to um, to get a handle on? Well, I think that with vaccine misinformation, there's a lot of a lot of content that is borderline where people say, did this nurse die from the vaccine? And, and that's not necessarily something you can you can say you can't share that question uh, or, you know, is it unsafe? Are you going to shed if you get the Pfizer vaccine? And in fact, other, there are so many crazy, I don't want to say crazy because people are, people are w working in a world where there is uncertainty. The science is moving fast. The, the recommendations are, are changing quickly. And so, a lot of just general questioning of okay, what am I supposed to do ends up fueling some of these rumors. People share these posts. Um, one of the things we focus on in our story is this, this wild rumor that, um, that the Pfizer vaccine can cause female infertility, which is not true. Um, but when people share it, they share it in a matter of personal concern. Like, should I let my daughter get this vaccine? Um, please help me understand. And then, um, then you have those emotional stories that translate better to social media. And then you have a company like Pfizer coming out and saying, well, the amino acid sequence is actually too short to mimic the placental protein. It'll give like a really jargony medical statement that is simply not going to go viral or resonate with, with people the way that, um, the way that the emotional content does. And when companies look at this, um, they're basically playing whack-a-mole. They can take down the top anti-vaxxer accounts. They can ban hashtags. Um, but this is a global conversation about public health that is continuing to develop and more stuff is going to come out. And there are, there are a lot of people who think of this as a, a, a problem of personal choice, or they think of it as a problem of, of um, regulations. And it's very difficult to, to figure out as a company, where do we come in and say, this is something that is harmful that could lead to people getting hurt versus this is normal debate about something that, that people should be allowed to debate because it's what everyone's talking about. Yeah. So, you know, you wrote this, as I said at the top, you know, uh, basically a history of Instagram, um, both as a sort of cultural phenomenon and as a business uh, at a part of Facebook. Um, you know, to what extent right now is face are Facebook and Instagram, you know, different? I feel like we're having this conversation uh, kind of about vaccines and Instagram. It's almost identical or not identical, but it's quite similar to the conversation we were having 
you know, whatever, four or five years ago about Facebook and other types of misinformation. Um, you know, how separate are Facebook and Instagram at the moment? And, and what has Facebook done to sort of, you know, bring them together? Well, Instagram lacks the, the virality of Facebook because there is no resharing. Content, the way uh, I put it is content um, doesn't go viral. People get famous. So that's one way to think about Instagram. It's like you have really influential accounts versus really influential pieces that get shared and shared and shared over and over. Um, that might make it harder to police. The other thing that might make Instagram harder to police is that it's image-based. Uh, it's, it's much harder uh, using a machine learning algorithm to detect the text in a meme than it is to detect plain text in a post. Um, and so a lot of what you see circulating in, in anti-vax world is screenshots of blog posts as opposed to the actual link to them, which can be easily taken down on Facebook. And, and Facebook has taken longer to understand those dynamics on Instagram. Of course, they prioritize Facebook first and Facebook is, is their flagship. There are more people there. So they have spent more time on solving those problems. Um, but when you look at the platforms behind the scenes, the, their value to, to Facebook and the way that they work, the teams that work on Instagram are merging with the teams that work for Facebook. The data that people share on Instagram is merged with the data that people share on Facebook. These companies are, uh, Instagram, I guess it's maybe six, seven years after acquisition, um, has been integrated so deeply into Facebook's infrastructure that when you are an employee at Facebook, they, they're almost indistinguishable, um, unlike when, when it started, when Instagram was presumed independent working within Facebook. Right. So let's broaden the conversation a little bit. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, kind of alluding to the, the, the antitrust um, inquiry that's going on with Facebook. Apple is fighting things all over the place. I mean, what what is kind of the state of play with with big tech in general? I mean, you have Facebook and Apple uh, fighting each other. Uh, the government's also going after Google. Sort of, who's in the most jeopardy uh, in terms of like like from a regulatory perspective among the big tech companies? I don't know. So these companies have have used these tactics of, of growth at all costs, of trying to dominate their industry and then expand to other industries, of trying to stay on top. And that's how they've been rewarded. If you look at their stock prices, they are, they are succeeding tremendously. They were the top beneficiaries economically from the pandemic because we really had no other option than to use Amazon to get our groceries delivered, to use Google to... Um, to do hangouts, to use Facebook, to connect with friends and family. Um, all of these companies became more useful in our lives over the last year than they were before. And their, uh, their advertising businesses exploded as small businesses needed to, to sell to customers online as opposed to in store. And I think that what's happened as a society is we started to think about them less as as just corporations where we have to look at, you know, are they meeting their revenue targets? Are they competing well? And looking at them as, as part of the infrastructure of society and saying, do we really want um, infrastructure that works this way? Do, we, do they have any accountability to us at all? Or is it just to their shareholders? And what does it mean for our economy to be so reliant on these companies? You saw Apple um, this week is, is uh, facing a legal battle with Epic um, with and generally a lot of concern from app developers for paying the 30% that they have to pay for the app store and the 30% that they have to pay for the Google Play store. So I think that in terms of vulnerability, um, I, I, think they, I think they all are. I think uh, Google is already facing an antitrust lawsuit from the DOJ. Uh, Facebook is facing one from the Federal Trade Commission. Um, we are seeing challenges getting built for the other companies as we speak. And so I think that this is going, we are heading into this era of reckoning for these companies from a consumer standpoint. Um, but at the same time, consumers love them more than ever uh, because of necessity. They really just don't have a lot of other choice. 
Sure. All right. We have uh, we're only about a minute left, but I, I've got a question here. So so maybe we can answer this um, pretty quickly. Um, but but uh, one of our uh, viewers is asking um, what form or, or, or style of social media, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, will have more attraction adoption going forward. Um, uh, let's. Uh, OK, so so that's kind of hard to predict the future. But but I'm kind of curious, like, do you think um, we talked about we saw TikTok. Uh, there was a lot of concern over that, both you know, from Silicon Valley, also from government. I mean, what's happening with the sort of TikTok versus Silicon Valley, you know, battle that was that we were that we were all talking about maybe six months ago. So in the beginning of this conversation, I talked about how social media companies have have focused on prioritizing content for what we want to consume. And when it comes to the future of social media, TikTok really embodies that. You don't have to do anything on TikTok. You don't really have to follow people. You don't really have to um, engage with your friends. You simply have to sit back and consume. And I think the way that we that we engage with social media and the way we engage with all of tech is, is going to become even less hands-on. It's going to become even more of a, a place where we are simply catered to by whatever the companies want us to see, which is which is going to prime us to be uh, consumers of, of misinformation or consumers of whatever is algorithmically attuned to increase our engagement. Um, so that's where I think social media is heading. Um, I think TikTok, after the Trump administration's end, I don't think that there has been as much uh, government pressure on them. I think there are bigger problems to deal with right now. Um, and I think that what we will see is is some new emergence of of companies that try to solve social media a different way, but I think it's going to be very difficult. I think Clubhouse, for instance, um, is not going to make as much sense post pandemic when we can all go back to conferences and dinners and, and spend our evenings other ways. Well, on that happy note, um, you know, I just want to thank Sarah Fryer uh, for joining us. Uh, you know, these issues, as you say, are going to be so important, you know, now post pandemic. And, uh, you know, I'll be reading your stuff. I know everyone else will be. Uh, Sarah Fryer, author of No Filter and a writer for Bloomberg Business Week. Thank you. Thanks for having me. When I think about the intersection between technology and transformation, I cannot think of a better topic to explore than trustworthy and ethical tech. Hi, I'm Quasi Mitchell. I am the Chief Purpose Officer for Deloitte, and I'm joined with my colleague and good friend, Bina Amanoff. Bina is the Executive Director for Deloitte's AI Institute and also leads our trustworthy and ethical tech practice. Bina, it's a pleasure being here with you today. Thank you, Kwesi. It's an honor to join you on this uh, session today it, it, and exchange ideas around ethical technology, a topic that I'm very passionate about and that is growing in importance in the society that we live in today. When it comes to the concept of teamwork, being a champion of ethical technology is a job for all of us in our personal lives, in our jobs, as consumers, parents, and everything that we do with technology. So I truly believe that technology enables us to make the world a better place. I'm a technologist by training, as you know, Kwesi. And I think technology can really drive to a more productive and prosperous society, but it can reach its full impact only when it's used and applied in an ethical way. And I believe the technologies who are designing, building, and scaling it have to be aware not only of the value creation of technology, but also about the negative consequences of it and mitigating it. Kwesi, how do you think about the impact technology has on our lives? Well, it's interesting because technology is ubiquitous. I can't imagine going or operating throughout the course of the day without technology in some form or fashion. And as you just mentioned, there are consequences, frequently unintended, just due to the rapid nature of which technology is evolving. And there are so many different examples of this, whether we think about baked in biases that occur, whether intentional or not, when so many designers, makers of technology are creating new tools that enhance our lives on a daily basis. Or conversely, if you think about the aspects of trying to spend time with your family 
without technology and just the absence of connection that occurs. So Bina, when you think about trust and how trust impacts or impedes the development and advancement of technology, what are your thoughts and what can we do about it? Yes, that crazy. That's such a great question. The first step is awareness. Awareness sets the stage for organizations to consider the implications, the ethical implications of its use of technology, right? New emerging technologies are always on the horizon. Therefore, issues of trust and ethics are not really going to manifest in just one single way. Educating employees and ad adopting ethical technology practice is going to help organizations stay ahead of the curve as technology, uh, emerging technologies come at us faster than ever before. As an example, Deloitte has established standards and codes of conduct around technology and its use. And uh, as a real example, when we, when the pandemic hit us, we were able to switch to remote work very quickly, almost overnight due to this code of conduct that we have within our organization. So our commitment to enabling a tech-savvy workforce underscores that ethics is not just about compliance. Ethics is informed decision-making and often debate and discussion. So our future is filled with promising emerging technologies, but really it needs to be grounded in ethics and everything that we do with technology. And Bina, those comments resonate with me because that debate that you mentioned just a moment ago and the conversations that must take place such that we can create a workforce that is both technically savvy and ethically savvy from the standpoint of applications of technology is just critical. It's a journey that we're on at Deloitte, and it's also a journey that we welcome other organizations to join us upon in the future. So it's been a pleasure talking to you and thank you so much for your time today, Bina. Thank you, Quazi. I'm Ed Hammond of Bloomberg News and uh, thank you so much, Marcelo Clore of SoftBank for joining me for this. Bloomberg Business Week conference. Marcelo, you're a man of several hats. Um, every time I talk to you, you seem to be very, very involved in a lot of different things across different companies at different stages of their development. What is taking up most of your time right now? Combination. First is we're living potentially in some of the most exciting times as it relates to tech disruption and equity investing or growth equity investing. So. Uh, at, the, at the speed that SOFAC is investing, you know, we always have a lot of different things going on. Also, WeWork is an important part. I took over WeWork, uh, it's going to be close to one and a half years. So we've been undergoing a massive transformation at WeWork. Uh, the launch of our Latin American fund, who, you know, I, I always had a hypothesis that it was going to be Latin American's time. So we've been doing a bit, bit of that. Launching the Miami Initiative, which is a uh, I think Miami is on fire, and uh, like anything else, it requires capital, requires support. So I've been spending some time in Miami, and then we have a, a lot of different investing companies, a lot of operating companies. We have satellite companies, we have energy businesses, we have robotics businesses, and also you got to add that we're investing about a billion dollars a week in the as SoftBank. So you know, there's always exciting things going on in in the field that we operate. Let's just start with SoftBank. Uh, results have obviously just come out from the company. Uh, somewhat disappointing for investors who I, I guess expected more buybacks. But talk to me longer term. What are the opportunities that you guys are seeing in the market? We know you had a fantastic pandemic. SoftBank invested very well very early in the pandemic and saw huge returns because of that. Now, as we shift into what appears to be this sort of next chapter of returning to normal, I wonder where you see the ability to capture that same kind of growth. And first is, you know, I think SoftBank results were our best results so far. They were the best results that any Japanese company has ever posted. Uh, $47 billion in, in profit, which I think is exceptional. Uh, I mean, no, nothing has really changed. We've been saying the same thing for the last three years. We've been saying that we're in the middle undergoing probably one of the most important revolutions in, in human mankind. You're, 
you're starting to see that pretty much every single industry vertical as we know it is going to be different. Five years from now, it's going to be massively disrupted. So we're looking for those companies that are the innovators, the disruptors, the ones that are changing industries, and those uh, that are basically, I would say, redefining the way we live, the way we work, the way we play. And when you invest in those companies, you really don't care about short-term results, right? We're not one of those companies that are looking, hey, is this, can we buy something cheap that we can 2x in a year or two? That's not our style. Our style, we're going to invest in those disruptors that those companies are going to be worth 10 times, 100 times in the next five to 10 years. So that's always been uh, the way we invest. And, you know, so far it's proven right. I, I, I take you back through memory lane. You know, a year, year and a half ago, everybody was doubting SoftBank, was doubting the Vision Fund. And God, what a difference a year has made. I mean, I, the, the, I think the combined IRR of the Vision Fund is, I think, that 43, 44%. The IRR for Latin American fund is 62%. And so far, the theory behind or the way we're investing is, is proven right. Talk to me about the LATAM business, because obviously that's a, that's a place close to your heart and, and an area where I know you're very focused in terms of the future of investment. What are the opportunities there and, and how does it sort of relate to what SoftBank is doing elsewhere in the world and the kind of markets it's wanting to go into? So... I like to look at LATAM first and say the size, right? Latin America's GDP is two times the size of India, it's two times the size of Southeast Asia, and it's only half of China. So therefore, Latin America has the size. Secondly, Latin America is behind in some, call it tech indicators, you know, say maybe, I'll say like five years from China. So it's nice to invest in a place where you've seen a lot of these business models already been successful in India and China in the US. So, you know, we, we had a plan, we had a 5 billion fund that was uh, supposed to be, it's gonna take five years to deploy it, pretty much the 5 million, 5 billion is fully committed. Uh, the IRR so far is 62%. We're investing in all sorts of companies from infrastructure to logistics, to health tech, to prop tech, to, to education, pretty much. And there's so much disruption happening in Latin America that you know, we, we, uh, we think the quality of entrepreneurs and the potential is very large. So we've been spending a lot of time in basically looking at these Latin American entrepreneurs who are similar business models to others. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, so far, so good. When you're deploying that kind of capital and, as you say, that very high rate of return, surely there's a, a call to invest more. Is this something we're going to see happen? Are you going to grow that fund? I mean, we, we think that there is great opportunities ahead in Latin America. So, you know, we, we don't have a mandate in, in the group that says we've got to deploy this much capital in, in any region in the world. What we do is we look at exceptional entrepreneurs, exceptional founders that are disrupting parts of the economy that are quite large. And in Latin America, you're seeing a lot of fintech disruption. I mean, because credit has been so scarce to the traditional consumer. I mean, to, to get a home, sometimes you've got to put 30, 40 percent down payment, which makes it very hard for the middle, the middle class to actually own a home. Uh, when you look at the largest cities in Latin America, the amount of real estate ratio compared to mortgages is so large. There are pretty much very, very few real estate assets are being financed. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of things that are broken in Latin America that technology is fixing. So therefore, when you have that size, first is we needed to go learn. So we've been doing this for two years and, and you know, we're going to continue to invest in Latin America. As we're going to continue to invest in the U.S., in China, in India, we've been doing a lot of investments in Europe lately. You know, Massa announced a couple of investment, European investments in, in the last earnings call. So, so, you know, we're a global investor and we're going to bed behind great entrepreneurs regardless of what part of the world they're in. Um, let me just ask Marcelo, as a sort of practical matter, when you're deploying that kind of capital and you're talking about over the past two years, obviously spending a lot in Latin America with uh, those kind of growth prospects in mind, when you do that with the overlay of the pandemic and therefore with the kind of companies that, that has benefited, the kind of technologies that, that has, you know, they may gonna succeed anyway, but it's sort of supercharged them. I wonder how you look through 
an individual event like the pandemic and say, these are the things we want to invest in that in five years, 10 years, 15 years are going to continue to have that growth rather than just be the ones that for the next whatever it is, year, 18 months, two years of the pandemic are able to harness the potential? I mean, the, the pandem all the pandemic has done, it has accelerated something that was going to happen in the next three to five years, right? If, if you, I, I always like to remind ourselves that the internet mainly disrupted two industries, right? The internet disrupted advertising. You have Facebook, you have Google, and the internet disrupted retail. You had the emergence of e-commerce. But really nothing else was massively disrupted, right? We still ate the same way. We still shopped the same way for food. We, and the pandemic, it forced us to basically digitalize pretty much everything that we do, right? So the pandemic digitalized e-commerce a lot more. I mean, today you get your food delivered to your home, you get your groceries delivered to your home, you get the uh, you know your late night ice cream delivered to your home in less than 20 minutes. Uh, you know, pretty much everything you you've learned how to order online. You know, can you really go back? Can you go back to a retail store and walk in and see if they have your size and be waiting? No, I mean you've learned how to shop on Amazon today for your clothes or whatever you shop. And it really works. Could you go back to not ordering food? I mean, I think it's hard. I think most families today have learned that you just go to an app and you can order your food. Can you go back to a doctor? I mean, it just, it's, it's painful. You went to a doctor, you waited a couple of hours. Uh, I mean, today you have a telehealth appointment, doctor shows up on time, which is nice, and you're able to get, figure out what's wrong and they're able to prescribe you here in that exact same way. Media, I mean, if for the people who've tried TikTok, can you get away from TikTok? Absolutely not. I mean, I see people who now you know, are consuming 90 minutes a day of their media via TikTok. Those things are never going to change. Those things are just going to continue to grow because they're solving a real problem. So I think what the pandemic has done, it has massively accelerated those trends that were going to happen anyway, but now they have ha happened faster and consumers are enjoying it. Consumers have figured out hey, it's not worth it to go to a supermarket and spend an hour when you can go to Instacart, put in your shopping list, and somebody will deliver those goods at home, and so on. I mean, I can go back to pretty much every single example. So what the pandemic has done, it has enhanced your productivity tremendously. You live a more convenient lifestyle. So I think overall, uh, these are trends that are here to stay and going to continue to grow. Another thing the pandemic has obviously done is change the way we work uh, in a pronounced way temporarily. And there's talk that longer term there will be a shift in the working model, particularly in, in the way people interact with their offices. I, I wonder with that in mind, why now is the right moment to monetize an asset like WeWork, which is sort of so dependent on people actually wanting to go into a physical office space rather than working from home? So we work. I think this is WeWork's time because the value proposition of WeWork has always been flexibility. And what the world is looking now is for a flexible workspace. There are so many different ways in which people are going to work. But what we're hearing from people is, first of all, employees want to go back to the office, right? Nine out of 10 employees say, I want to go back to the office. They don't want to go back the same way. They don't want to go back to one headquarters and be there nine to five. Some say we want to be there three days a week. Some say they want to be two days a week. Some say four days a week. Some say, I don't want to drive to a headquarters. I want to work close to home. So there's going to be so many different business models. But what I do know is that companies are not looking forward to going back to the traditional way of signing a 20-year lease and setting up these non-flexible headquarters. That's that. The office is very different today. You know, the biggest or most of our larger customers are the world's most valuable companies who basically are sending us their employees because they don't know, you know, how many days they're going to be working because they don't know where their business is going to grow. And when you're sitting in the only company in the world that has over a thousand buildings in pretty much most important cities around the world, the demand for WeWork space today is higher than it was prior to the pandemic. So what the pandemic allowed WeWork allowed to reinvent itself. It allowed to learn how to operate on a most uh, cost flexible basis and now you have a we work that like i said before you know we work should be a profitable company by the end of this year or by the beginning of next year is latest and demand for this type of flexible of space is higher than ever and i think the world is going to redefine in terms of 
where flexibility becomes the most important part that a company can offer its employees. I got to go there with the crypto question. Obviously, we worked last month, announced that it would be accepting payment in the form of cryptocurrencies, notably Bitcoin. It also said it would hold some on its balance sheet. Today, we saw Elon Musk come out and say Tesla would no longer be taking Bitcoin over concerns about the impact it has on the environment. Obviously, the environmental impact of mining Bitcoin has, has gone up significantly over the past few months. Is that the right move? Is that something we're likely to see WeWork follow or is that just a sort of a reaction to, uh, to a short term trend? No, I mean, the reason why we decided to accept cryptocurrencies was because our customers were asking for it. We you know one of the things that we do with Sandeep is we listen to our customers a lot. And we have to, right? They tell us the type of office they're looking, they tell us the type of setups that they want. And and the, the crypto word came out a lot where employees say, you know, we would like to pay you in crypto. We have accumulated a significant amount of wealth in, in crypto that we would like to use it to pay for rent, as rent becomes an important part of many companies. So we decided to basically accept crypto. And at the same time, you know, as people pay us in crypto. It to us, it's just another currency. It's like we're holding to, we have US dollars, we got euros, we got pounds, we got crypto, we got Japanese yens, we got uh, so. To us, it makes no difference. And when our customers ask for reimbursement in crypto, we pay in crypto. And we have, you know, we've had some of our customers who are paying us in cryptocurrencies. And we have some landlords who said, look, I would like you to pay me in cryptocurrencies. So, you know, uh, the way we work looks at it is, you know, we are, we're going to listen to what our customers want from us. And if they demand it, that they wanted to pay in crypto, that's how we do crypto as a form of payment. Do you have a level that you'd be comfortable going to in terms of your sort of total uh, money going in and out in the form of crypto? I mean, today is a very small part of our business. I think it's the beginning. I think crypto is a mega trend. I think crypto cannot be ignored. And, uh, you know, it's going to grow according to whatever our customers want. If our customers want to pay in crypto more, you know, we're going to accept crypto. If our customers want to pay on traditional currency, we're going to accept form of payment as, as traditional currency. So to us, this was nothing more than a move to basically help our customers satisfy some of their needs that our customers were asking from. Or obviously, our first customer and the large one was Coinbase. Not a lot of people know, but you know, the headquarters of most of the real estate that Coinbase uses is WeWork, and and being them the largest exchange of cryptocurrency, they you know they they they, had, they were the first customer to pay us in cryptocurrency. They pay you purely in cryptocurrency. I think it's a combination, combination. I mean, I don't know exactly, but uh, but they were the first customer that actually wanted to pay in crypto. Now, inevitably, SoftBank is one of these companies because it's so big and because it has uh, such a strong track record that is is constantly uh, attracting intrigue around the characters. Uh, Master Sun has proved himself to be a highly successful investor through good times, through bad times, obviously through this recent pandemic. Uh, in terms of key man risk, who is the right person to take over should he step down? There's obviously yourself and Rajiv Misra sort of both fairly close to the top of the organization. You know, I mean, that's, that's a subject that only Massa knows the answer. I mean, Massa is incredibly active. Uh, Massa is a hands-on manager. Massa meets with every single one of the entrepreneurs that we invest. And we hold, you know, daily meetings with Massa in which, you know, we're always trying to figure out how we can make our entrepreneurs work together, how they can leverage the, the ecosystem. And we're, we're close to, I would say, 240 of the biggest disruptors sit within the SOFAC ecosystem. So it's fascinating to see our entrepreneurs or founders engage with each other, help each other. And Massa is incredibly active in that. So that answer only Massa knows and, and he hasn't shared it with anybody. And when I think of the the sort of the different characters inside, you know, Mr. Mystery is is, is often cast as the uh, as the sort of soft, uh, cuddly side of it. You know, the the, the friendly face of, uh, of of SoftBank investing. You're more the operations guy. Obviously, you fixed the T-Mobile um, situation. You're now fixing the WeWork situation. Is that a fair characterization of the the two of you and the roles that you fill within the organization? I mean, I think there's so much to do in, in SoftBank that we all divide and conquer, right? Anytime there's a big issue with the company, you know, I'm, I'm usually the one that gets sent to the get sender. I had a personal attachment to Latin America, so that's why we launched a five billion Latin American fund. 
I would say that the vision for Massa is an incredible, active, hands-on manager, and him and Rajiv partner quite well. So we as a team, you know, we figure out what needs to get done, and and I think we're very complementary. You know, we all have complementary skill sets. I think Massa sets very clearly the strategy. Massa sets the vision. Massa sets where we want to go. Rajiv is the financier of the group. You know, he's he's, he's highly involved in capital allocation. And uh, I'm the operator in the group. So between all of us, we all help each other to make sure that SoftBank continues to be as successful as it's been. And, and SoftBank is one that is continuously, you know, reinventing itself. If you see what we've done, we've gone from a telco with a lot of different operating businesses. We've gone last year through, we clean up our balance sheet. We sold a lot of businesses. We did a, a pretty large buyback. And, and Massa has said it very clear that we want to be an investing company that is investing in companies that are going to transform the way we live. So, you know, I was in charge of selling most of our companies or monetizing our assets. Now that that's done, now we're, you know, say we're 90% an investing company. And, uh, you know, once you invest, there's some businesses that are going to require us to get more involved and some others that don't. And that's the way we, we run the company. Where does T-Mobile fit into that ecosystem? Obviously, again, you were sort of instrumental in A, bringing that merger together, but then working out what the SoftBank role was going to be. I wonder, is that a company you see SoftBank being in long term, or does it not match the growth prospects that you would want for the fund? We remain a, a large shareholder of T-Mobile. We did a we did a large monetization last year. If I'm not mistaken, it was the second largest monetization ever done in the financial markets. That basically, that was money that we brought in, so we invested into high-tech companies or tech growth uh, companies, and we still remain quite a large shareholder of T-Mobile, and we're working on synergies. I particularly work together to figure out how can our companies work together as T-Mobile develops this amazing 5G nationwide coverage. A lot of our companies are going to be dependent on that on quality of, of, of the network that T-Mobile is building, and we're finding ways to work together. I mean, autonomous vehicles are are the next big thing that's coming. And, you know, a 5G or a 6G network is going to play a key role on a lot of that. So a lot of these companies require an amazing network to process the amount of data that's being processed in order to generate the insights. So Timo is a big part of the question, and, and T-Mobile is doing great. And obviously, another area of your focus, and you and I have talked about this previously, but it seems to just grow and grow, is Miami, which is, uh, of all the cities, certainly on the East Coast of America, that I can think of has done best during the pandemic in terms of uh, attracting all kinds of different people, all kinds of different businesses, and just seems to be riding on the on the crest of a wave. What are you doing down there at the moment? Talk to us about this $100 million you're investing in tech startups and how that's going. So Miami is close to us, right? And Miami is very close to me. That's where I started my first company, Brightstar. That's where we're investing in the in the largest last mile distribution company called Riff. All the different parking lots that we have there. And uh, what happened with the pandemic is when people were given a choice of they could work from anywhere, then suddenly people went to Miami and they realized that Miami has a quality of life that's very hard for any other city to match. And if you add to the fact that there are no income taxes in Miami. Suddenly, you started to build an ecosystem from hedge funds, venture capitalists, private equity, startups. And it was like the perfect situation where, where you found a politician, Major Suarez, who actually welcomed tech, who says a welcome investment, all the quite basic things. And you had adverse politicians in the West Coast. So that basically caused the perfect reason to have a lot of people moving to Miami. And like anything, like any, you know, any tech hub that's information, you need capital. So we found a great opportunity for SoftBank to commit a certain amount of capital. You need talent. And suddenly you have a tremendous amount of uh, inflow of talent going to Miami. And you combine that together and you suddenly start companies, you start seeing companies being built. So right now Miami is experiencing a boom. I mean, I was looking at the numbers of venture investment. I mean, there was close to $2 billion last year. That's significantly higher, something like 6x what was happening in the last previous years. Suddenly, you have a lot of funds that are there. We're there. Founders Fund is there. Atomico is there. Pareto and so on. So suddenly, a lot of things start happening. You have unicorns. There's nine unicorns 
that are there. So you have new category entrants. So suddenly the place feels, it has an incredible feel like, you know, what Silicon Valley used to have a few years that somehow got lost. So, so the, you know, but I, I believe think, in, uh, and Tomo Bravo, the, pandem- the big Silicon Valley players are, are setting up there right now, right? Yeah, I mean, pretty much I would say that if you're not setting up there now, you have a presence in Miami. And it also helps, you know, Latin America is, uh, there's a lot of business to be done in Latin America, it becomes a gateway of the Americas, great place to live, good weather, no taxes. I mean, it's like all stars have gotten a line for Miami. And, you know, we'll give a lot of credit to, to Mayor Suarez, who's basically opened the doors and, and is a forward thinker that is actually welcoming all these companies who, who traditionally, you know, tech, very different than other companies, are not those that look for big economic incentives to move and all those things, you know. Tech just wants a place where there's talent, people are treated well, and nobody's asking for any tax incentives or economic incentives. So we're there to invest, we're there to foster the new companies that are being formed. So pretty exciting times for Miami. Marcelo, fascinating conversation. Great to have you on, great to have you joining us, and hopefully next time we'll have you here in person. Great. Let's do it next time in person. Thank you. Thank you. The ninth Fast and Furious, or F9, looks like a return to form with over the top cars and even more over the top stunts. There's no bridge! Oh, hell no. But what diehard fans are most excited about is the return of director Justin Lin, who directed the third through the sixth films. But why did he leave? And why is he coming back? To answer these questions, let's rewind to 2002, when Justin Lin had just scraped together enough cash to make his first film, Better Luck Tomorrow. And it's a shoestring budget, $250,000? $250,000, it was, um, I had saved up $20,000 cash from all the fellowships and scholarships and then um, just work. And then I had 10 credit cards, which amounted to about a little over Uh, (laughs) $100,000. And uh, that was enough to kind of get going. So it's it's at Sundance in 2002. It gets picked up and released 2003. Yep. And it's not long after that that Universal Pictures comes to you and says, we have this franchise, the two of them have been made. None of the stars are attached for the third one. Want to direct it? Yeah. And what I've heard that you say it was an easy thing to turn down. Um, I remember watching the first one uh, when I was in film school. And I, I, I love the world. It was like this really kind of, I don't want to say bittersweet because it was still an enjoyable film, but at the same time I was like, oh God, it's still like the Asian American in the film, they're always, you know, whenever they're there, they have to be around like, (laughs) they always have to have pagodas and Buddha statues next to them. So it was years later and I was shooting in London and Jeff Kirschenbaum tracked me down in my hotel room and I just said, no, I'm, I'm good. And he just kept calling me, he wouldn't stop. <laughs> Again, this is Tokyo Drift, so like, this is now, you know, they have, you know, geishas and, you know, cars drifting around Buddha statues and stuff like that. I, I just didn't find that very appealing. That's and in the, that. the original script. In the original script, The one script, that yeah. was handed to you, yeah. Yeah, and so he said, he said, hey, wh- why don't you come and um, meet Stacey Snyder, the head of the studio? I give her so much credit because she said, okay, well, what if you can change it? What if if I let you do what you want? And I said, okay. And she said, well, you have like, I think two and a half months or something like that to to redo everything. I I felt like it, it was an opportunity to be able to correct something, you know, and to, you know, and, and it wasn't just me. I remember when we would um, go and I was trying to interview for tech advisors and there were a lot of uh, people that were like, no. And that was, a, that was a sign to me and I had to find out why. And finally I found 
Toshi Hayama and I, I, I said, why are you guys so hesitant? And he's like, ah, car guys are kind of off this franchise. And, and I said, I was so curious. I said, well, well why? And they said, well, uh, it's become like um, the cars, the CG, the, 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 the scene. And he gave me this list. And so I said, whoa, OK. So I decided um, to just go and hang out with him. And so we would go to tracks, you know, and, and really hung, hung out with people who, who love cars. And they would drift and things like that. And so I felt like, OK, that's part of what I have to do, first of all, before anything else, is to really try to kind of figure out and understand the passion for cars. That was the thing that I think for Tokyo Drift, to try to course correct, correct not even representation, but the idea of making sure that people that love cars will respect this film. So that was, that was the big exercise I found like very early on. It got to a point where we're like, well, God, we should get Vin Diesel to show up. And everyone's laughing at us and like, ah, the, the, he done the second one. And we got word that there was, it was impossible. Of course, when you hear impossible, you're like, OK, we got to go get him. And nobody believed us, you know? And even when I got to Vin's house, you know, we, I remember sitting there um, by his pool and just talking to him. And it was nothing about him coming in or anything, but we just kind of connected on building stories. And you know, now that I know Vin really well, I realize he's a big Dungeons and Dragon, you know, fan. And so I think, you know, we actually spend so much time now talking about things that's not even in the script. And that's that's where it all started. It was this four hour conversation of talking about the connection. I could see that he was connecting to it. And um, and the great thing was it it honestly took us four movies. That poolside chat like resulted in four chapters of Fast and Furious. It really was something that I, when I sat down and talked with Vin, it, 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 it took four films and it was also time for me to go. I was lucky enough where, you know, I think when I grew up, it was always about just trying to survive, trying to pay the rent. And I got to a point where that was not the case anymore. So I felt like if I didn't take advantage of that situation, um, it was not only going to be like I was going to regret it, but I, my big fear was that it was going to hurt the franchise. Because then I, if I'm just doing it just to do it, then that's not good. So um, it, it ended up being a great journey. I got to give like everybody at Universal so much credit because even though I left, I, I would always still get kind of like uh, nice messages and, and always got a feeling that whenever I wanted to come back, I'm totally welcome, which is great, you know? And then also like Vin would just call me Tyrese. I think he maybe missed the poolside talks, you know? I remember I, I, I was in the cutting room for Star Trek in Vancouver and he calls me and he's talking to me for two hours about Dom. You know? and so like, I was having fun, but I'm like, wait, I have, I'm trying to cut a movie here, Vin. Like, you know, and so, uh, but that's, that's, that's always been the spirit of kind of who we are, you know? And so, but there, it was this one trip where I, I was down in Cape Town in, in, in uh, uh, South Africa for Warrior. We were scouting for a show that we have shooting down there. And I was coming back and, it was just a trip where somehow, like, you know, people recognize me here and there. But that trip, like, someone, rec like, a group of fans recognized me at the airport, Cape Town, talked to me about Fast. And I was like, great, thank you. Johannesburg, London, New York, and LA. It was, I actually think back now, I think that was the trip that, like, for some reason, something, it was like everybody talking about, like, what they like, what they didn't like. Because it was like two months after that, I woke up and I was like, Oh, I think I know what the next chapter is. For me, it started off very um, simple in that trying to make sure I respect the fans. You know, at the premiere at Cologne, Germany, where I'm sitting and talking to like a father and son, and you could see, wow, that you know. The dad's entry point was 
the first Fast and Furious. And the sun's entry point is Tokyo Drift. And now it's, that's a generational uh, relationship, you know? And so um, I feel like if, if we were always going to repeat ourselves, not even in action, but, but even like not really care about characters, then we shouldn't be making these movies anymore. And, and I'm also lucky. I, I'm with a group of people that will not let me forget either. Not today. Is there anything you can tell us about 10 that, that is, I know you've committed to directing 10, and is it in the writing stages? Is it, we're, where we're, is it? We're writing, you know, now, like I'm actually gonna jump on a plane to go see Vin um, for the first time in like a year uh, next week. So um, it's definitely brewing. Fast 9, F9 is really the first film of the final chapter. So it was actually, it's actually been very liberating. It's a very different process. So 10 is not necessarily the last one. It sounds like it most definitely is not the last one. I would say the last chapter, I think, you know, we have so many characters that my problem is actually real estate, you know? And so to know that, hey, you know, we have F9, but I also now have real estate for two more movies to be able to tell this last chapter. It, it, it has like really, again, it, it's a very kind of, for me, it's a very fresh way of, of, of you know, really kind of crafting what we're going to do. All right, hi everybody. Carol Master back here with Business Week editor Joel Weber. I want to be on a plane headed to Vin. <laughs> Vin sounds like just having a little rapport with Vin. That's like, you know, like that would be the highlight of my year, I think. A highlight of my whole life. <laughs> um, let's talk about, first of all, some great stuff. He talks about, you know, building these movie franchises. I feel like WeWork has become this great business franchise well, in mean, terms of a story. Yeah, and, and it, we've, we've saw, we saw the rise, we saw a little bit of the fall. Maybe yeah. now there's a comeback. Like, I, I love that. It's a, you know, like that's the story of business in many ways is just the sequel, the sequel, the sequel. Sometimes you get nine of them or, or more maybe. Well, think about it. you guys. It was a cover story, right? When it was kind of on the way up and we've really seen it take go kind of to its lows and now it's kind of back up again. More, more, to, more to come, I think. Yeah. And we should point out that uh, Mr. McClory also mentioned to us that in terms of their locations, I think he mentioned a thousand, but they've got about 850 WeWork uh, locations. Can I just say what's interesting, Joel, I thought about kind of today's coverage, there was so much talk about the pandemic and how our world has changed and whether it was DAZN or whether it was Vimeo. I mean, many of these talk in their book a little bit, but saying that how these changes, the changes that we've seen, they're going to stay with us. I think we're looking at the future, right? Yeah. Like all of these things, it's about like what's to come, where do, where's the ball headed and how is business pushing us there? So yeah, much, much of this to me was about what the future is going to look like. Right. What was your favorite part? Favorite point. I really did like listening to Kevin Mayer of DAZN. I mean, just, you know, listen, he has such an interesting background, Disney, TikTok, here he is now uh, really working in the sports world, but just talking about kind of combining streaming of sports also yeah. with gaming right. and all the revenue opportunities. What did you like? Well, the, the stat that stuck out to me that he said was 90 minutes a day people are spending on TikTok, that's amazing. Yeah. So uh, just why well, I'm not of, getting the laundry done. Uh, <laughs> speaking of getting um, uh, videos, I, that Mars rover stuff, I just thought was phenomenal. That was going to be my favorite takeaway from today, until I learned that Vin Diesel and Justin Lin played Dungeons and Dragons together. Like that is amazing. <laughs> I, that was like I, just this little kernel of goodness. I can't wait to uh, see if we can attend one of these sessions. You know what's really funny, too? I just feel like all of these companies, it's just a reminder that, I don't know, go back 10, 15 years, we weren't really talking about them so much. But whether it's Vimeo, whether it's DAZN, these are like some of the major players that are really filling up our world. And, and some of them didn't exist then, right? So not only, and, and you know, as we learned with Vimeo, I mean, that was a huge strategic pivot that got them to where they are now. And that's going to be another one that by the end of the month, there's going to be, you know, potentially a spinoff that we're going to be looking at and covering as news, no doubt. Yeah, exactly. And they've got their IPO next week, yep. so we'll be watching. All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us for day two of the Bloomberg Business Week. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, enjoyed it. <laughs> Let's try that again. <laughs> enjoyed it. Thanks to all of today's speakers. And we also want to thank our sponsors, our solution sponsor, Deloitte. Our presenting sponsor, InterSystems, and our supporting sponsor, Indiana Economic Development Corporation. And, of course, without them, we could not have had this event made it possible. If you'd like more information, though, from our sponsors, do check them out. All you have to do is visit the Resources tab. You can find it on your screen.
And most of all, thanks to you for being such an engaged audience. The hashtag is The Business Week. Please engage with us. We'd love to hear from you, what you love, what you'd like to see more of. And we'll be back tomorrow, Wednesday, where we'll be focused on finance and economics. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join us tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Have a great day, everyone.